Hi everyone, I'm Kyle Bechet, and this is the AAF Exchange, a podcast from the American Action Forum, where experts provide clear, data-driven insights into today's economic and domestic policy issues. Welcome, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, that's, that looks like 15, 15-3, no, no touchdowns scored, it's going to be great. So you're still on the no touchdown train, you think you're going two weeks without we scoring stick. a touchdown. Okay, let's just be clear. I mean, <laughs> first of all... Can we just talk about week one for a second where our interests were finally aligned, where yeah. you were actually rooting for the Patriots for once, and we came through for you. Yes. So I just want that acknowledged on the record. Um, My happiness guess, came and went very quickly. Yeah, it's amazing, though, that you guys still find a way to win, even though you're one of two teams without a touchdown. We did this all last year, too. This is not new. <laughs> There's nothing new about this. We have changed the, the name of the loser quarterback. That's all we've done. <laughs> Yeah. Last well, year, if the defense didn't score, we wouldn't win. Yeah. I mean, I'm in the same boat. If our defense so, doesn't play well, then we're yeah. not winning that. We're not winning games, and Ramadre, the offense is going to run through Ramadre Stevenson, and that's about all we have hope for because our offensive line played as bad as well as they could play on Sunday, and it still was a little shaky. Yeah. But anyways, I think we should probably talk about things other than football. Okay. So I'll do the introduction. Do the introduction. On this episode of the AAF Exchange, Congress's September government funding sprint, the latest economic news, and the Biden administration's paperwork reduction effort fail. Joining us to discuss all of this, AAF President Douglas Holtzakin and a, later on AAF Director of Regulatory Policy, Dan Goldbeck. Doug, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure. So before we jump into everything, uh, tell us what's been on your mind recently. Uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, unexpectedly. Yeah. Um, uh, didn't uh, make a New Year's resolution to study sovereign wealth funds. Never happened. Uh, but lo and behold, last Thursday, uh, former President Trump, uh, in, an, in an address to the New York Economic Club, says, I think we should have a, a sovereign wealth fund. Um, and then the next day, the Biden administration reveals that we've been working on one, honest, which f sort of felt silly to me. But um, uh, at the same time, it, it frustrates me to no end because— you know, there are countries that have sovereign wealth funds, large uh, capital um, accumulation controlled by the sovereign for purposes. Mm -hmm. What purposes might they be? What did Trump mention? What did the Biden administration mention? Well, Trump says infrastructure, innovative new therapies, great new developments. Um, well, we have infrastructure bills. We have the National Institutes of Health. We have DARPA. We've got all that stuff. Um, you know, the Biden administration says, well, we, we can influence important allies and stuff. Well, we, we have the, you know, International Development Finance Corporation, which was designed in 2018 to do just exactly that, to counter China's influence around the globe. So there is no reason for us to have a sovereign wealth fund. Mm -hmm. All it would do is take money out of the normal process and thus the oversight of and yeah. the control by Congress. These guys just want to have a, a piggy bank to play with. No. Yeah. No. And, you know, there's more. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it really does seem like it's just a way to get around, you know, pr uh, for lack of a better word, parental oversight over the trust fund. Like, yeah. you know, that to me, that's what it sounds like. It's, you know, I just want to go out and use the black credit card and not have to worry about, you know, somebody telling me, oh, you got to stop spending uh, this and you can't spend it on this, but you can spend it on this and things like that. The normal appropriations sure. process. And, and then there's the how do you get a sovereign wealth fund? Well, they yeah. would have to levy some taxes and not spend the money. Okay, that, that doesn't happen. I mean, you and I both know this, not happening. But it, that tells you where the real wealth is. It's in the U.S. economy. Our sovereign wealth fund is the largest, strongest economy on the globe. Let's take care of that, and we'll yeah. have the resources do whatever we need. Yeah, that seems like it that's would be, it. Yeah, just keep growing our GDP, keep grow, putting, you yes. know, continuing to accelerate, like you said, the greatest economy on you know out there and continuing to make make it not harder for people to do business in the u.s and that's how you get more of that revenue rather than creating this fund that nobody was ever going to contribute to unless you levy a tax yeah so um i hope the discussion on sovereign wealth funds is over yeah i fear it's not yeah do you, do you, but do you think it's just one of those you know silly campaign things that you know we get i don't know on? maybe they went to the same seance i have no idea where these people get these ideas <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's not a good idea. Yeah. But nothing spreads like a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, not even COVID. I mean, bad yeah. ideas are incredibly <laughs> infectious. And and campaigns are the most yeah. fertile 
breeding ground for bad ideas right. that you will ever find. Oh, I mean, we've had a couple of them already. Taxes on tips. We've had, you know, etc. Yeah. We don't need to get let's, down that route. Let's well. weaponize the FTC to go after grocers in Kentucky, yeah, yeah, Ohio. Yeah, yeah, yeah good was, idea. Yeah, there, we'll talk about the Fed later, but, you know, there was the proposal to, you know, the president should have more authority Control over the, the Fed. Fed. Yeah, so, I mean, but yes, anyways, larger point. Yes, I think given their outstanding successes at fiscal policy, we should have the executive running monetary policy as well. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I might start drinking. Oh wait, that already happened. <laughs> Who knows? All right, well, <laughs> let's let's get back on. Let's get back to. Uh, let's turn to Congress. Let's, th that sounds like a good. That'll good, cheer us up. Yeah, that, that, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, they're back. Yep. Um, uh, they have you know just a few weeks to go to fund the federal government. Um, they pulled the bill yesterday, I believe, from the House. Yes. From a vote. Um, the calendar. You know, the calendar. We're running out of time before it turns. I believe it's the end of the month, right? Correct. So where do we stand on all this? Uh, I think you gave a nice summary. Um, the speaker put on the floor uh, a continuing resolution uh, that went for six months uh, and then also had the, quote, SAVE Act, which would require states to have people display proof of citizenship before they vote. So um, every uh, Democrat in the Senate said the SAVE Act's a non-starter. Um, it passed the House as a standalone, so if you wanted to pass it in the Senate, you could do it as a standalone. Uh, this looked to me like the Speaker having to do due diligence to keep the presidential campaign happy, because mm -hmm. uh, Trump wanted this. That's reality in election years. You want to, don't want to get out of step with the top of the ticket. But he knew it would fail, and he put it on the floor as quickly as he could to, to demonstrate that. Now they move to the real business of funding the government. And they're really there's really one major issue on the CR, like CRs or CRs. Uh, the biggest issue is how long. Mm. And the six-month CR is a non-starter um, from a number of perspectives. First of all, the Pentagon has said fairly bluntly, unusually bluntly, we can't live with six months. Yeah. You need, guys need to do this for a couple months, fine, we can manage that, but no. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they're hearing that. Um, and it, as a political matter, you kick it to, to March of next year, Whoever controls things in March next year gets to write the, the bills, and many people prefer to just kick it to December. That's yeah. the tradition. A um, member of our board, Ken Keyes, uh, a good friend for a long, long time, said his forecast has always been December 13th because that's the last Friday before the Friday before Christmas, and that's when they always yeah. keep, do the CR. So yeah. here we go. <laughs> I mean, you know, we've seen this playbook a hundred times I, over and over. You know, I think we've talked about it many times. You know, they're going to go right up to the deadline. Hopefully they'll get some sort of a deal done. It'll go to December 13th. There are zero people also, saying it would be a good idea to close the government yeah. in election year. Zero. Yeah. So be clear, it, this is all preliminary skirmishing. Yeah. They want to get this done. Mm -hmm. The superstitious person in me thinks, oh, the Friday before, is uh, Friday the 13th, so, you know, that's, that's a little dangerous. But anyways, um, is there, so, I mean, there's no hope for the regular budget process right no. now. I mean, there's just no. too much politics in the air. There's an election uh, the cycle. There, there are 12 appropriations bills the House and Senate have to pass and agree on. The House has passed five. Mm -hmm. Maybe they only passed four. At least five got, got done. The ledge branch didn't pass. Senate has done zero. Mm -hmm. So it's over. Yeah. I mean, everyone, because, I mean, also, you know, they're up again, you know, not just the September 30, uh, you know, end of the month deadline. They got to go home and run for real. Most of them, all the House has got to run for re-election, and a third yeah. of the Senate's got to go home and run for re-election. So, you know, that that also changes the calendar a little bit. Uh, yeah, the, there has to be some deadline that matters to Congress. Mm -hmm. Usually it's September 30th. Mm -hmm. In this case, it might be the next town hall because they, they really do need to be home campaigning. Yeah. So I think I, th I expect this to get resolved mm -hmm. in relatively short order because everyone agrees it needs to. Yeah. yeah. What about those other items that we call must do items? Um, what, 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 you know, what, what else is out there? Well, there are pieces of the farm bill that where the authorization is going to expire that, that uh, sort of across the board, the, the CR will probably have to carry some short term extensions of authorizations because they haven't gotten around to reauthorizing mm -hmm. important programs. Um, that, that's, that's the stuff that goes on behind the scenes as they sort of talk about, you know, 
are you willing to put a one year extension into this CR and we just don't have to worry about that for a while next year? Or are you are we just gonna extend it for three months? National flood insurance programs we've seen done again and again and again this way to my eternal chagrin, mm-hmm. as you know. Uh, so you know th- your that, favorite person on flood insurance got involved in the political process this week. Uh, Taylor Swift uh, continues <laughs> to intervene, but not in ways that I care about. I want her to fix the national flood insurance program. With her stature, we could actually get something sensible yeah. done, but no. Yeah, and she she instead wants to write pop songs and be rich. <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> Any avid reader of the dish obviously knows about this ongoing uh, feud. We'll it's, it's, it. it's a one-sided feud, to be <laughs> <Yeah>. honest. <laughs> Pretty sure she probably has no idea. But anyways, continue. <laughs> so anyway, that's where we are in, yeah, the, in, yeah. the, in the annual appropriation slash CR the cycle. I mean, that's always something around this time of year? It, it has to get done. And, right. and again, it will get done. But... I think they're fairly comfortable doing that when they come back in the lame dot. Yeah. Uh, that, that I don't feel an urgency to get that done by September 30th. Interesting. All right. Uh, let's move on to the economy. Okay. Um, you know, this week we got the the consumer price index came in at around expectations. Yep. Um, uh, the PPI came in this morning. It's softer than expectations. Um, yeah. Uh, Not dramatic. Jobless claims, expectations. Right in line. Um, but, you know, there's signs of cooling for the for the inflation the past couple of And the labor months. market as well. And yeah, the labor market as well. So, what what did we learn in general about the economy at large from these reports? I, I think that to date, the Fed has been very successful at moderating inflation without creating a recession, um, and that that is now what many people expect. If you look at the the sort of big banks, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, all their their economic shops, they put out their forecasts. Um, Nobody's forecasting a recession. That wasn't true a year ago. Yep. Um, so that that's a forecast of a soft landing. And so the real question is, number one, what are the risks that remain that you might want to watch out for? And I think there's some real ones on the household side uh, where we've seen some you know, credit card defaults creeping up and some signs of financial distress at, 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 the, at the lower end of the, the market. Uh, and in the labor market where... The way the cooling has happened is they have slowed down the hiring. Uh, We haven't seen any layoffs. UI claims have not jumped up. When Mm. new claims for UI jump up, then the layoffs are happening. We haven't seen that at all. So um, we've gotten two successive ADP employment reports uh, that showed net negative job creation in small businesses. Keep an eye on that. You look at the the BLS uh, payroll employment, all the job creation has been in a couple of sectors. For about four months, we've seen health, education, and government. That's not broad-based, robust labor market. So if that cracks quickly, you'll know when you see layoffs. So yeah. you just watch the UI. Right, and those, and you said the last three months, so you know those are seasonally adjusted too. So like education, yeah. you're just going back to school now, it's not like it's you're seeing a wide gap because they're going back no, to no, school. No, yeah. that, that is accommodated by the data to the extent you can. It's right, the, exactly. the science, I mean, yeah. you know, it's not perfect. Um, but, uh, so I, you know, Good reasons to be optimistic. Um, you know, there's there, there's risk on the other side as well, which is we got the CPI report, and yes, it, all the numbers hit roughly expectations, but the top line uh, CPI went down because we had a, a roughly 20% annual rate decline in energy prices. Mm. That won't continue. Food prices went up at a 0.7% annual rate in in uh, the August report. So, food and energy, these these sort of big critical things, were very very soft, and that that pulled the number down. Shelter. Our old friend shelter picked back up yep. and continues to to plague these reports. And so, services in general, shelter in particular, cool slowly, and they are mm-hmm. cooling slowly. And there is always the risk that if the Fed is too aggressive. Yeah, you restart that inflation process. So, so yeah, speaking of the Fed, the you know the big economic debate is of course you know how much will the Fed cut? They have a meeting next week, so you know what what do you think should happen, and what do you think will happen? Both uh, twenty five basis points. Yeah, there there are, there are reasons to believe it's time to be less restrictive. Mm-hmm. Um, they have f- signaled so much that they're going to cut. I think at this point they they can't not. Yeah, and th- there's no justification for fifty basis points, and they shouldn't do it. Yeah, I think it would look panicky. Yeah, I think a fifty basis point cut would actually be more alarming than comforting. Yeah, I because I, I mean I think you made the point this morning on on Fox where Fox Business um, you were on talking about the PPI report, talking about how you know Powell said th- that they um, you know talked about how they will move sl- um, slow. Um, they also uh, the guy you were on with also made the point that you know. Um, 
you know, there is usually a decline in the stock market after the Fed moves like this. Um, so, yes. I mean, what, so what about a soft landing here? Is is that still what they're aiming for? Of and course. Are the you know are we still on track for that? The warning signs there. We're on track. Um, I I think remark they've this, they've succeeded remarkably well. I, I think the one thing where when I look at the universe and the Fed looks at the universe where there's a, a some gap is they worry more probably correctly about financial fragility and the and the sort of uh, financial stability on top of just the pace of job creation and economic growth versus inflation so they've had rates elevated for a, a relatively long time which has produced a lot of stress on the banking sector and other financial intermediaries i think they count that as a negative about where they are right now i discount that mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't worry about that in the same way this Mark Tepper worries about the stock market decline. Right. I don't. Right. Um, and that's not to be harsh about people's 401ks, but you know, if you take care of the underlying real economy, the mainstream economy, the 401ks will take care of themselves. So yeah. I, you know, I tend to focus on that. Mm, interesting. Well, uh, it's time to turn to regulations, another favorite topic of ours. Oh, but regulations. Before so we're gonna you know what the Daniel. new regulation we're is? Gonna, gonna you have to give me the answer to the trivia question. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say. Uh, Dan, uh, we're going to bring Dan Gold back into that. Good. But before I let you go, uh, it's time for your favorite time, uh, which is also— You think I would learn to study for this, but no. I don't. Well, you could—it's from this morning's dish. Okay. So Didn't read that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wrote my section. <laughs> it's the rest of it. Yeah. Um, so— it's 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 a it's a regulation that came through the the full elimination of de minimis a U.S. trade rule that allows imports valued below eight hundred dollars to enter into the United States free from tariffs and added fees will result in between what costs annual costs that would be passed on to consumers it's a range so if you get it somewhere in that range I'll give it to you oh and my like, god that's and that's it's billions a, oh I know it's billions I, I, I the question is is it is it uh, uh, something like two to six, or is it something like sixteen to twenty? Yeah, it's 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 about eight to thirty is the is the answer. Eight eight billion okay. to thirty billion. So brackets still with single and double digits. So yeah, that's about right. Okay, but, I mean I mean that's an extraordinary cost to pass on to consumers, and you know maybe a little. You t t t so think about this. I mean, this is why I don't understand the I understand why people are after this. It also means that you, in principle, are now going to collect tariffs on the de minimis amounts. Yeah. You know how costly it is to administer that? I was going to say, like... Like, it's just not yeah. worth it. There's a point at which you say no. Right. I mean, it's got to be, like, such... Like, I mean, is it... It's, it's like, is it really worth it on the margins here to, right. to really go and, and pick that up? Because, I mean, net, you're going to be spending as much money as you're bringing in. So this is yet another example of trying to move government policy into the 21st century. Given that you can now buy from China, let's yeah. take, take the obvious uh, uh, culprit, online, I could order something from a Chinese firm have it over the internet, have it delivered to me directly, and it would avoid being put into bulk shipment that would be subject to tariffs because the, the value would be real high. I would just have mine. Mm -hmm. So what they're trying to do is catch massive influxes that happen in small increments direct to consumer. Okay, I, I understand that, but... Let's be realistic about how you go about doing it. Right. So th this probably won't work. Well, Jacob Jensen uh, has a great research a good paper. paper. He has great yes. research on that. That number comes from his research paper. So if you are interested, people should go read it. Yep. Anyways, Doug, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, good luck to your Steelers this week. Um, uh, hopefully, I can't say good luck to Beth Seahawks this week, but... I, I was going to say, um, bad luck to the pa Patriots this week. I have to live with Beth, so... <laughs> you, I just may, work for you, so... May, may the Seahawks win. <laughs> well, thank you, Doug. Thanks. All right, let's turn to uh, Dan Goldbeck, our Director of Regulatory Policy, to talk to us about regulations. Dan, welcome. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. So you have to be in a good mood before we jump into things. Uh, the 49ers look like they haven't lost a step. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, defense is looking a lot better, too, this yeah. year. Well, they least. helped me win my fantasy league, so I was smart enough to uh, pay attention when they pulled CMC to go and grab uh, oh, Mason yeah, yeah. there on the waiver wire, and we avoided a, disa a week one disaster. Can't wait to see what the team looks like at full strength now, too. <laughs> yeah, so that should be fun. Anyways, let's talk yeah. about regulations, what people actually probably want to hear us talk about. Sure. Uh, the Biden administration has released its latest report on its efforts to cut regulatory paper work burdens just generally what what did we learn from that report so yeah so a couple months ago 
the Biden administration had this burden reduction report. It's the second that it's had so far, and it's focused primarily on addressing sort of administrative burdens and red tape in these public benefit programs, so things like health care, Social Security, that sort of thing. And they were able to find about 34.5 million hours of reductions over the course of this past year, which is not nothing. But then just this past week, I saw in my sort of daily tracking of the overall government-wide paperwork burden, it reached its highest level ever at 12.1 billion, with a B, hours of paperwork across the board wow. each year. So you take it basically from the year, the previous report, uh, there's been about 1.6 billion hours added to this total since the prior burden reduction report. Mm -hmm. Take that versus the 34.5 million that they sort of recognize and yeah. reduce. It's like there's just this wide disparity in the scale of the problem at hand and the solution that they're going for right, right. now. It's always interesting because each week, you know, you, in your week in regs, you, I always see that tr that administrative tracker. Um, you know, I always focus on cost because I think that's the 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 number that your eyes go to first. But is that is is his numbers extraordinarily higher than the pre than the Trump and o than President Trump's administration and President Obama's administration on the paperwork side, like it is on the cost side? So in terms of the paperwork attached to specific regulations. Yeah. He's definitely ahead so far, uh, but it's not as wide of a disparity as on the cost side. And the thing with this paperwork situation is that a lot of this is already existing paperwork requirements mm -hmm. from past administrations that just gotcha. continue to be on the books. And no one seems to be checking to see if they're even worthwhile, if they should mm. be adjusted in some way, that sort of thing. Interesting. Okay, so and, and so that report in this report is supposed to help sort of figure that out a little bit more. A little bit, yeah. It's 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 a very focused approach, and obviously, it's not really addressing the overall scale. Right, right. So, yeah, given given that red tape, you know, problem ha that has grown over the years, and probably will continue to grow as we add more and more regulations as yeah, the administrations yeah. go on. How how do you think we should address all this? So yeah, so part of the program that I point out in the paper here is essentially an idea that we've kind of banning about over the past few years here in AF called the paperwork budget. And it's kind of, you know, it's a pretty simple concept in that it's similar to, you know, people are probably f familiar with the Trump administration's regulatory budget. You know, obviously there's the fiscal budget that the federal government needs to, or should have each year. You know, sometimes we don't quite get around to that. Um, but, you know, it's just the idea of a budget in general. And we, you know, I'm able to draw, obviously, this 12.1 billion, billion hour figure from uh, the data that the government already has. So I walk through a little bit more step by step in the paper of basically, you know, all right, we have the data on this for the most part. We probably need to check that data to make sure because I just noticed, for instance, there was this one item last week that had 200 million hours attached to it that just apparently fell through the cracks and the agency just realized it. So there's obviously some pretty significant items there that you know just fall by the wayside and so we need to get a handle on that for sure. And then once you do that, you can look at you know the various agencies' amounts and then try to parse out you know what are things that they have the discretionary authority to mm -hmm. change versus things that might need a more legislative approach. And then from there, you just, like with any budget, you set certain goals of, right. you know, either keeping it steady at this level mm -hmm. or trying to reduce it either by like five, 10, whatever percentage you would like. And so from there, you can mm -hmm. you take more of a holistic approach as opposed to, oh, hey, this seems like a good idea here. Once you have the whole picture laid out, you can really sort of focus on the areas of need and what's really feasible and what's not yeah so is that is that budget you said you mentioned a, uh, is that budget similar to the one that was used under the previous the previous trump administration is it similar to that or is it a bit i mean different? It, it, it would be sort of different but it's the same idea of essentially you know each of these paperwork requirements if you think of them kind of yeah. like a regulation mm -hmm. and they have this hour attached to them so you take that and you either figure out ways to reduce that hour total either by streamlining digitizing certain things, that sort of thing. You know, there's there's plenty of strategies on the, the micro level to do it. Right. Uh, but then this having this overall budget framework gives you sort of a guiding path for what you're trying to attain in terms of overall goals. Interesting. Well, your paper is hot off the presses today, I believe. Yeah, I mean, just this morning. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we'll obviously include the links to that in, in the show notes. But Dan, thanks for coming on and walking us through all that. Oh, yeah, thanks. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Tune back in for our next episode, where our experts will provide clear, data-driven insights into today's economic and domestic issues. 
I'd also encourage you to check out any of the links in our show notes and also follow us on social media to learn more about AAF. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play.